Facebook, hello, and welcome to this week's episode of the Voices for Change show, filmmaker Tracy Schatz podcast dedicated to ending the international devastation of intermittent partner violence. I'm Hope Katz Gibbs, producer and of the show and founder of Incandescent Radio and Incandescent TV. Right, we are live. And today's topic for the show is the long-term impact of survivor gun violence. Our guest is the amazing Kate Ranta, a survivor of domestic abuse and gun violence and the author of Killing Kate, her amazing book. So we know you're gonna learn a lot from this truly amazing women, both of these truly amazing women. So I'm gonna throw it over to Tracy. We'll talk to you soon. Hey. Thanks, thanks, Hope. And thank you, Kate, for joining us. You're welcome. Kate, Kate Ranta um, is uh, a survivor of uh, intimate partner gun violence and survived a homicide attempt um, about 10 years ago, right? Um, eight. Eight yeah. years ago. Twelve. yep. So um, I, met, yeah. I met Kate um, when we were doing uh, Finding Jen's Voice. I had put out a, uh, a social media post looking for survivors of intimate partner homicide attempts. Kate was the first person to respond um, to that uh, post and also the first survivor that I ended up interviewing um, for Finding Jen's Voice. Um, Kate, I remember us spending about three hours or more yep. in her apartment. We were both, I think, exhausted when it was over. It was mentally draining for sure. <laughs> Emotionally draining. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Derek uh, Diener, who was our um, director of photography and co-producer mm -hmm. on Finding Jen's Voice, you know, said to me as we walked out of there, he goes, I don't think we can do more than one of these a day, Tracy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm exhausted. Um, it, your story um, is compelling, and um, I really encourage our viewers to get a copy of your book, Killing Kate. Um, and um, you can also uh, hear some of uh, some of Kate's story in Finding Jen's Voice, um, which a pitch we are doing a free screening of tonight, Tuesday, uh, the twentieth at six p.m. Eastern Time. Um, and if you go on our Facebook page, you can see information about how to sign up for that. So, Kate, why don't we just give everybody just a snapshot of your experience, and then let's talk about the issues. Um, oh, snapshot's really hard. I know. <laughs> There's just so much. Um, well, so, let me set, set it up for yeah. you. So, you were leaving, um, you, had, you had left your mm -hmm. husband. You had at that point, um, William was what, four years old? Um, when I first left, he was like two and a half, three. Right. And um, you've been going through- um, Contentious part, divorce. Yeah, contentious divorce. Family custody, court, yeah. Family court, child protective services. There was yeah. all kinds of, all kinds of people actually involved in your life, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you um, had just moved into a new apartment and you were being pretty careful about not letting mm -hmm. him know where you were. Yeah, um, so about um, a year and a half into the divorce proceedings, I had moved out of um, our marital home and I had rented uh, an apartment probably about a mile away or so. And I didn't give him specifically didn't give him the address because his behavior was just escalating and he was um, threatening with, you know, taking uh, my son William from me and get, gaining custody and and it was just it was a really scary time. Um, I picked an apartment that had like it was like a gated community. I, I really tried to do the things that I needed to do to, you know, to keep us safe. Um, but unfortunately, he he was able to find me. He stalked me to my apartment and um, opened fire on my father and me uh, right in front of my my son, our son, William, and who was four by that time. So like the absolute yeah. worst hap like the worst case scenario happened for us. Um, and we've talked about this too, about just the uh, systems in place to protect us just failed completely. Um, you, had, you had called the police that evening. 
Um, I had, I had, he had slashed my tire and I knew it was him, but no, I didn't have video. I didn't have actual, you know, physical proof that he had done it, but I knew he did it because he had done similar things in the past. Um, you know, um, like vandalized my car before. So, um, yeah, I called the police anyway, just to try to get something on record. And, uh, she, she, just took the report and asked if I had a restraining order. And by that time I didn't, and I had been turned down for three. Um, and so, yeah, she said there was nothing that she could do and that I should go try to get a restraining order the next day. And I said, well, I already been turned down for three. What's, what's going down there again gonna do? Uh, and I, I said to her just as she was leaving, he's going to have to kill me before you people do anything about him. And then literally like 15, 20 minutes later, he, he showed up and, and shot us. And he, sh he shot right through your door. Mm -hmm. My dad and I were pushing against it to keep him out. And when he actually first got to the door, we didn't even know that there was a gun present. We didn't even know he had a gun until the bullets came through. Um, right. At, like as we were just getting the door locked. You've, you've gone on to speak about gun violence um, a lot since this happened to you. Um, and one of the things that I've heard you say is, I'm one of the lucky ones because I can actually talk about being a gun violence yeah. victim, which doesn't happen very often. Most don't survive, um, as we know. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the fact that I took two bullets one through the hand, my right hand, and one through my left chest, just missing my heart. The fact that that happened and that I'm still here at all, um, it, you know, I, I knew that I needed to, I knew I needed to speak out about it. I was just so angry that it had happened at all. It was so preventable. Yeah. And if we kind of rewind, um, there's, there were lots of, um, there were lots of signs that things yeah. were not good with him. Yeah. Um, and um, he was in the military. He was. He When I met him, he was a captain, and then uh, he was promoted to major, and then, um, yeah, and then they retired him. Um. But, but <laughs> meeting him and him being, uh, you know, a captain in in the military. Mm -hmm. I mean, how did that impress you uh, on first meeting? So I had never, I'm not from a military family. Um, I had never really been around people in the military. I had never, definitely never dated anybody in the military, uh, but I met him online and um, I, I do, I mean, he was very handsome and, uh, you know, charming, like we, like we always hear. and. I definitely think that the military thing had an impact on me. I knew because he was an officer, obviously he was um, well-educated. Um, he had told me that he worked on, um, he was in contracting, government contracting. And so he would buy parts for the, the predator plane. And he had high security clearances. And so I, those sorts of things made an impact on me trust wise, because I was like, well, I mean, this guy is really together and he's honorable and he's an officer and he has these clearances. He's got to pass all these tests. Right. Right. <laughs> um, so it, it, it was definitely like romanticized a little bit, I think in my, in right. my head. And as you were together, and how long were you together all from? It was three, it was really fast. It was three years all together from start to finish. Three years, right. And yeah. so by the end of that three years, um, that there, there were issues in the military and they really didn't support you. Correct. Um, he, it's so complicated, but he had basically forged um moving orders from uh the base we were living on in the dc area to move our things to florida nobody even asked about it um he really he literally like changed a pdf and handed it 
in and they accepted it and moved our things to Florida. And I knew there was no stopping somebody like him. I couldn't talk to him about it. Um, I told him I didn't think it was right, but you can't stop somebody like that. So that had happened. And then once we got to Florida, literally everything exploded after three months um, in January, 2011. And that's what sent me running out the door. He had threatened to physically harm me, which was the first time in all of that time that it, um, it even got anywhere near physical. It was all emotional and psychological abuse up until that point. Um, and he threatened yeah, you with I, a gun. Yes, yes, he would. Yeah, he, he did. And uh, I reported him at that point to the military, to his commanders, and they, um, called him back to the base and held him there while um, basically the um, military's version of the FBI is Office of Special Investigations. So OSI was looking into him for fraud and spousal abuse. They held him on the base there while the investigation went on. I got word after a couple months from, that, from OSI that he was guilty. He was found guilty on both counts. Um, but that his command would be able to make a decision about what to do about it. So including letting him go. And it's what they I did. Still, yeah, I was so naive. I thought, well, I mean, their soldier did the, did wrong things. I mean, he, he, and uh, no, they let, him, they let him go. I got um, an email from his commander saying that they handled it administratively and they didn't want to, he did, they didn't want him to lose his pension, his 25 years of service pension. And so they were just gonna retire him. And that's exactly what they did. It was infuriating. I begged them, begged them not to do it because I knew he was gonna be off his rocker as soon as he was released because I had reported him. They put me and my family in direct danger. And and what was their response to that? I mean, how- Didn't did even they respond. Say, Nothing. Nope, I never got it. I never got a response. And how long after that um, did you begin to experience um, more abuse and more threats? Well, after um, it was it was long. And so he was uh, retired in timeline gets so hard. Um, this has been a while. I believe he was retired in March of 2011, and then the shooting was November of 2012. So within that time frame, is when everything was escalating and escalating, and um, you know he he was just erratic and and just constantly making threats and um, demands about William. It was it was just such a scary time. And, and I think we have to be clear that, that we're talking about somebody who had never been physically abusive, nope. he never punched you or nope. strangled you or nope. you know, physically intimidated you. He threatened you and he emotionally yeah. abused you. And uh, by threats, I mean more like oh, for custody related things, right. not I'm going to kill you. There was never anything overt. So it was just really hard to pinpoint what he was going to do right and he had guns he did have guns <laughs> lots of guns and so you know gun violence unfortunately has um it never leaves but it's it's reared its ugly head in the media again most mm -hmm. recently and and there's conversations um in congress again about um you know limiting um the availability of guns to mm -hmm. abusers and um, people with criminal records and doing background checks and all of that I mean, kind of stuff. Makes sense, right? <laughs> it seems to. Um, if, if your husband hadn't had guns, uh, your story would have been very different. Absolutely. I mean, I've had this conversation a lot in, in the past eight. Now, I guess this is this this November will be nine years. So I, you know, sure. If he hadn't, he could have come after me with a knife or he could have come after me with a car. Like, you know, the gun folks like to say that they'll use any other device, but 
I just feel like with a gun, it's just so much more lethal. Um, I, I mean, it, it to be shot is it's just very, very hard to, to describe. Um, I know obviously he definitely could have used other, other ways to come after us, but uh, his weapon of choice was a gun because he knew it could get the job done and get it done quickly. And we would be less likely to be able to fight back. Right. Yeah. It's very hard to defend yourself from a bullet. Right. Um, you, but you know, so with with uh, gun violence, uh, one of the things that we know is a woman is five hundred percent more likely to get killed yeah. mm-hmm. in an intimate partner um, violence relationship when guns are present. Correct. Five hundred percent. Five hundred percent. So that's a huge, yeah, huge number. It is, and. Can't argue um, with that. And one and the other thing is every town against gun violence has has put out um, some research showing that what was what are the latest statistics? Fifty four percent of all mass shootings are perpetrated by people with a yeah a the most so, yeah in our society you know the mass shootings are the ones that get the most attention from the media. But the fact is most mass shootings, the majority, you know, most mass shootings in this country are domestic violence really related. So this guy comes in and, you know, wipes out his entire family and takes his own life and there's a mass shooting just because of the sheer numbers. Okay. Um, it, it, the gun is the choice. That's, that's what they're choosing to use. Right. It's, I mean, it's, it's much, uh, it's much more hands-on um, to use any other weapon, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You, can, you can really kind of phase out and disconnect when you're pulling a trigger. Well, and I always say just from our experience that I would have much rather have gone up against him with if he had a knife or if he had tried to drive at me or something than the surprise of those bullets coming through the door. I, I mean, we didn't, we didn't even know it was coming. In spite of the fact that you didn't know it was coming, um, there are people who suggest that um, what women need to do is arm themselves. What do you, how do you respond to that? Oh, uh, I get so worked up <laughs> about that topic. Um, yeah, I've, you know, I've come across people in this journey that have blamed me for my own shooting. Uh, why wasn't I armed myself? I wasn't, I, it was my fault that I didn't protect my family, that I didn't have a gun on me to respond to him, that I didn't shoot him dead, all of these things. And I, I just think that there's this, like, I always, I call it a vigilante myth, like that people just think that they're just going to like take a gun and blow away the bad guy and, that's it. And that's all that happens. But it's so it's, it's such a myth. That's just not how it unfolds. First of all, we didn't even know he had a gun until he shot. The space was so small. My apartment was tiny. If I had had a gun, you would have had four human beings in a very small space. And what I'm shooting at him. What if I hit my own father or my son accidentally? I'm not trained like, like, my ex was in the military. He's trained with this stuff. I, so it's just, it's, it's preposterous, honestly, to think that if I had had a gun that somehow I would have been able to blow him away and, and that would have just been it. Well, and I've spoken with police officers and people who were in the military who say, you know, taking a human life is, is, um, is, is not easy. You know, it's, no, it's, it's and that's that most, you know, most like part of part of military training is to desensitize you to taking a human life. Correct. And that's the thing I, I think that people miss when talking about intimate partner violence and guns and arming women, because here's somebody who they've been your partner in whatever form that looks like. Maybe you've had children with them. There was love there once at one time to actually take that gun and pull the trigger and take somebody's life who you had strong feelings for at one point. It's just so incredibly 
um, it, it places the, 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 the blame on the victim. Like the victim needs to be able to do this. And when actually faced with it, you might not be able to do it. And that's, that's also dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because of course, um, the gun could be taken away from you and used. Against right. And you're, right. Um, yeah. So, so what is, what is the solution? What, how should we be talking about guns and, and domestic violence? What, what, what are the, what are the things that we're missing in this conversation? Well, I, something that's frustrated me with, uh, within the gun violence prevention movement is, um, it's known that a lot of these mass shooters that, that, you know, went and like shot innocent people had violence against women in their past. Right. So to me, it's <laughs> how we need to address more strongly when men are violent against women, because they're not only, it's a ripple effect. They're not only dangerous to their partners and their families and extended families, um, they're a danger to society at large because if they're going to be violent to somebody that they purported to love in their life, they don't care about the people that they're going out to shoot in a mass shooting. It's such a red flag. It's a huge red flag. Right. Um, but you know, the, these guys are given one, two, three, four, about like a million chances and they get their guns back. Um, because their rights. And I, it's like, what about our rights? What about our rights to be to be safe yeah, and not under attack. Yeah, there, there's something um, a, a little screwy when we're, when we're uh, talking about protecting the, the rights of abusers to have guns. Um, and, you know, VAWA was held up for the last several years yeah. because of the boyfriend loophole. Correct, I actually spoke at um, a couple of press conferences um, was it spring of 2019, I guess, um, with uh, Senator Klobuchar, um, they, you know, calling on Mitch McConnell to to authorize VAWA, and it was it was the the boyfriend loophole that an intimate partner would be is um, I, I think the law is that it was like it, it was labeled spouse only, right? Or you and had so the so. Yeah, something, something like yeah. that. So it, yeah, the boyfriend loophole is that it it doesn't cover every type of domestic abuser. Right. Um, and so I just it it's so frustrating. And I I you asked what the answer is, and I honestly don't know. I've been at this for a very long time. Um, you know, my my thing is just take their guns away at the first, take them away and take them away forever. Um, at the first show of uh, violence toward um, toward their partner, but I don't feel like that's ever going to happen. I don't know how that'll ever happen here. Yeah, um, it. <laughs> every time there seems to be a little glimmer of hope that maybe something uh, around that might change, it, it doesn't. You know, I mean, I I grew up. You know, I grew up in a hunting family in Western Pennsylvania. You know, there. Mm -hmm. I mean. People in my family have guns. It's, but Culture. that's that's a totally you know it's it. We're not talking about your Second Amendment, right? No, no. We're talking about your you know the rights of a victim of victims of abuse to stay alive, um, and the the responsibility that goes along with the right of owning have gun ownership. If you if you don't do your part, if you're not a good citizen, you're not allowed to have guns. I know, I know. It's so frustrating, and the laws are so different state to state. There's you know nothing federal um, that has any teeth in it. Uh, in Florida, um, when I did get my first and only temporary restraining order, I was told by the police that they could go in and take the guns in the home and asked where they were. Um, but then, th then they followed that up saying that he could go out the very next day and buy a new gun. So what's the point? What's the point? And then he, he was, I, he was really, really very upset that his guns were taken. He was really upset about that. So that's great. So he's, you know, now he's all fired up about that. 
and he can go out the next day and get and get a gun. I just it makes no sense. What what's your response to people who make the argument that um, well, if he can't get them legally, they'll get them illegally. I mean, it's sadly it's the truth. It's yeah. sadly the truth. I mean, I was told that uh, he did get he did get the gun that he used to shoot us uh, legally. He, it was not purchased illegally, but these these gun shows and private sales. Um, that's that's where it's abusers can can still do it. They can still get them. Um, I, I just it's such an epidemic, I, I guess, um, that it seems completely out of control. And I wish I had the answers, but I really I don't. It's very frustrating. And um, being in this space in the you know gun violence prevention space has been um, incredibly difficult for me as a, like a gunshot survivor um, who can actually speak to what it feels like. Um, this lack of empathy from so many is stunning. So maybe, maybe that's part of the, the solution is to really help people understand what it feels like. Yeah. What it yeah. Feels like. Uh, I've been really um, open about showing my my wounds on social media uh, through the years. Um, I have pictures of the crime scene. I have pictures of my hand uh, stitched up. Uh, so I don't have any, I don't have any of what it actually looked like. I, I actually can't remember what it actually looked like. Um, but I, yeah, I have the stitches ones and I just feel like, that's the stuff that people need to see when it comes to talking about gun violence, like what it does to our bodies. Um, the, the damage is just unreal. My hand, I'm almost, I'm eight and a half years out now and it's still numb, um, it's stiff. I, it, it's still, uh, it's sensitive to um, hot and cold. It's something that I'm always gonna live with. And, and I should have to. What's and that? You're, and you're a writer. You right, yeah. And I'm right-handed. Exactly. <laughs> I'm a writer, and I'm right-handed. I, I type differently. Uh, every everything. It's it's a daily reminder. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember in the film you talked about your seeing your hand explode, mm -hmm. which is um, which is kind of it's very it just, it's a very yeah. graphic description actually. Yeah, it just was like, like poof. and then um, I remember like kind of going back like that and in pictures and the crimes that you can see the splatter up, up the wall. Um, just so much blood, so much blood. Right. And your father was shot twice. Yes, he was and lived. <laughs> We're very, very lucky. He was shot uh, through his left arm and it's still dis it's it's disabled. Um, I was able to get like range of motion back in my hand, but his is disabled. And then um, my ex shot him point blank uh, in his left side, and it missed organs. I don't know how, but it missed organs. Wow. He de he did have to have the bullet removed, and it, they were able to remove it, so he doesn't even have, I guess, any fragments or anything in his body. So lucky. And um, your four-year-old son witnessed all of this. He did. How he did, did it impact William to, to witness this kind of violence against You him? know, um, to this day, his anxiety and PTSD, the trauma, has, he's 12 and a half now. And the way I would describe it is um, he not only is overly protective of me in a way that like no child should have to worry so much about like their parent uh, on that level, you know, um, wants to know where I am pretty much all the time. Um, you know, I, if I don't answer a text immediately, he, he starts to panic. 
that all of his anxiety is around losing me. He's, he, he doesn't trust men at all with me. Um, he, he's hyper vigilant when we're out and about. He's a, he kind of watches around and checks the scene and see if there's any sort of men looking at me weird or anything. He, it's, it's definitely like a anxiety and a hyper vigilance around losing me. Right. Uh, and I, you know, he was four, now he's 12 and a half and it's, it's still there. It's still there. Sure. He's not a tween who's like, ah, I don't, I, I don't care where you are. I don't even want to talk to you. He's, he's, you know, very close to me. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, um, what we know about kids and, um, uh, trauma is that at it, every stage of development, they have to re revisit that trauma. It doesn't go away. Uh, they don't, no, no. They don't get over trauma. And we heard a lot of the platitudes like, oh, he was only four. He, he, maybe he won't remember it. Kids are resilient, all of that kind of stuff. And I'm like, there's no way. He, he, you know, maybe it'll fade a little bit, just like the, the images in his memory, but he'll never forget that it happened. Right. Uh, he'll never forget that it happened. It's, uh, you know, people just want to pretend that when these bad things happen, that, you know, everything's going to be okay. And that, that's just for their own comfort thing. It's not okay. You know, that, there's... Tra that trauma is, is um, horrible. Um, when a stranger, when, when a child witnesses a stranger shooting never mind your father, but, but it's your father. So how does that impact your own sense of self? Um, you know, one of the things I used to say when I was doing child therapy is, um, and I'd have battling parents mm -hmm. and I'd say, listen, you know, you're part of him. She's of him. You, you know, you have, you have to kind of work this out because when you disparage with a child, Correct. That Couldn't agree more. and, and, you know, it's, that's a real thing to have to disengage from, from half of yourself. Right. Right. And what's so hard with that is that when you're dealing with somebody like my ex, who is a psychopath, basically, the idea of co-parenting with somebody like that with success, um, that's like a whole nother topic <laughs> um, about, you know, family courts and the way that they treat battling parents and, and think that, you know, a victim of abuse is really going to be able to successfully co-parent. Um, it's, it's impossible impossible it is and unfortunately um uh child protective services um representatives need to catch up they're so the behind whole, yeah they need, they need to catch up on understanding um, the dynamics of abuse they do i i can't tell you when child protective services was involved in our situation because my ex had given um i believe it was a sleeping pill to william he was three um, child services brought charges or the state brought charges and child services oversaw this, but they didn't take it very seriously. I can't tell you how many, uh, caseworkers were like, oh, he's, he's so, um, you know, he presents so well and he's, he's such a good father and she must be the crazy one because he, he just seems so wonderful and so put together that kind of stuff. And then he shot us. And I'll tell you, the main co the main um, caseworker that worked with us, she came over, and my dad and I like screamed at her. We were like, "We told you, we told you that he was dangerous. We told you that William would be in danger, but you were so busy trying to close the case, you didn't believe us. And look what happened." So I hope that at least our our situation changed some stuff with those workers in Florida. Um, because they, they, they wouldn't believe us. They wouldn't believe us when we said how dangerous he was. Well, I've known a lot of people who work in child protective services. Nobody goes into that field who doesn't really want to protect children. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's about um, really being misinformed and not truly understanding this dynamic of right. the problem. 
and it's hard. It's, it's, it's so a lot of what I, you and I have been working, you know, doing for years is really trying to like open people's eyes and help them understand yeah. that this is, this is what a dangerous relationship looks like and we can't minimize it. I was lucky enough a couple of years ago to talk with uh, a group of um, uh, caseworkers in DC. They were DC uh, child protective services workers. And I, I didn't sugarcoat it. I did not sugarcoat our experience and it was actually well received. I could see them like, Oh, you know, their eyes getting wide and just shaking their heads at what I was telling them had happened down in Florida. And I just kept being like, listen, if there's a woman that's telling you that her husband's abusive, he's a psychopath, he's, you know, a manipulative narcissist, he's this or that. Why don't you just start with believing her? And if it turns out she's lying, because if it turns out she's lying, it'll come out. Yeah. But I, I, why don't you just err on the side of caution and believe what she's telling you um, and, you know, protect, protect that family. Yeah. It's, it's uh, maybe that's a good place to end today uh, mm -hmm. with starting, starting by believing. Yes. And, believe uh, women. <laughs> belief. Yeah. But believe people when they and men believe, believe. If, yeah. if somebody is is a victim and they're they're saying that they're a victim, the truth comes out. It does, and and you know what? I, nobody wants to be a victim. No, <laughs> I wish none of this had never ever happened. I wouldn't. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I've done a lot of advocacy and awareness and all of this stuff, but I mean, I would love to have just kind of lived a quote normal life whatever that would look like you know i didn't want this i didn't ask for this right um so hang on one okay. second i'm going to grab You're ah good. thank you <laughs> so um this this is a, a a great narrative um of case experience and so i encourage you to get it um it's on amazon uh, personal power Barnes press uh, Personal Power Press is the okay. publisher. They have their own website. You can Google it and you can also get the book from there. But I, I believe Barnes & Noble as well as Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. As well as Amazon. And so I'm guessing you would have rather written a novel. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not whole... a book about no. somebody trying to kill you. It was an excruciating <laughs> process this with my co-author and me I mean I couldn't even I couldn't even put pen to paper to use an old school term I, I was so traumatized I knew I wanted to get this story out thank god Elisa Devine found me and you know we worked together I did a lot of the editing and I mean we were just a really good team and that's really the only reason and way I was able to get this book out there's no way but yeah I would much rather have written something lighthearted. <laughs> Yeah. So, but yeah. I, I'm glad it's out there and I hope it helps people. Well, I know that your advocacy work is, has helped many, many people and your voice in Finding Jen's Voice is extremely powerful um, and, uh, and, and moving and um, has really helped a lot of people as well. So Good. I'm sorry you've had to do this, be on this journey, but uh, I know appreciate that you've been on this journey with me yeah. um, you've taught me a lot thank you. and um your support has been incredible so um thanks kate and thank you. Um, keep up the good fight all right <laughs> all right thank and you. we will talk soon i'm sure <laughs> yep, absolutely we will. all right Thank you, guys. Right. Please give a quick shout out for, um, we're going to post it on social media all over the place about the free screening for Finding Jen's Voice, which is this evening at 6 p.m. Eastern. Is that right? 6 p.m. Eastern. We're doing it through a Zoom webinar. So if you, in the uh, post um, accompanying this uh, Facebook Live, you'll see a link where you can register. Uh, we can take up to 100 people and then and we're cut off and we're going to be joined by four of the survivors from the film who are um, going to be there for q a after we view the film so it's always um really powerful when the the survivors whose stories we learn in the film are there to answer your questions and you can kind of catch up with them uh, the film was released in 2015 so everybody's um 
you know, moved on in different ways, uh, but certainly um, most of the uh, women in the film are still very active in terms of become, being advocates and um, really trying to get the message out to prevent what happened to them from happening to somebody else. So um, to all of you, I'm grateful and uh, join us tonight. Absolutely. Join, join them tonight. Join all of us tonight. Um, and next Tuesday, Tracy will be interviewing another survivor, but with a different twist. Janine Lattice is the author of the international bestseller, If I Am Missing or Dead, A Sister Story of Love, Murder, and Liberation. So that's another horrible but important and impactful lesson for us to all to learn from. So yeah, take- I'm looking forward to seeing Janine. She's, um, she's got a, a very powerful story, but she's also freaking funny. <laughs> um, so we will, we'll have some fun with Janine next week. All right. Well, you are listening to Voices for Change radio and TV. Thank you so much, Kate. Thank you so much, Tracy. I'm Hope Katz Gibbs, and we'll talk to you soon. Mm-hmm.